Today we're talking about seeking divine answers and we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses number 9 through verse number 11. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Amen. Seeking divine answers. I found that life is multiple choice. And when we're trying to make decisions, we usually can narrow it down to two. You get down to this, this, these two choices, and I find that we base those a lot of times on our criteria, our choices. And I've made decisions, and maybe you have too, where you have chosen, and then later second-guessed yourself. I should have went for the other option. We may have chosen one that was the least expensive, it was easiest to get into, it was, it was the fastest, it was the most popular, but we find that it may not have been our best choice. So we're constantly in life trying to find out and navigate to our best choices, what's our best options. When we want that, we ultimately know that God is the answer. But sometimes we fail to go that direction, we fail to look in that direction and see what God is saying about the decision. We usually have our checklist, and we want God to approve our checklist. These are, God, I've narrowed it down to these two, God. I've narrowed it down to, to her or her sister. So I need to, which one? <laughs> I just need you to co-sign on what, what I must do, God. We, we, we get down to our choices, and we want God to, to give us that best choice. But ultimately, we have to, we're the one that prepared the slate. We didn't ask God about what goes in, we ask God for the outcome. We want the best outcome from God. Yes. A friend of mine, were, he was wanting to buy a house some years ago. He was a single parent, he had an eight-year-old daughter. And he had it down to two houses, and he had Kim and I to go out and look at these houses with him. He kind of had it down to two. And we looked at the first house, kind of like, <laughs> Kim was like, so let's see the second one. We went to the second house. As soon as we walk in, he was like, this is it. This is, this is the house. And he's like, really? How do you know? I was like, this, this is it. This is your place. This is the one. And he was looking. He says, well, it's a little bit more than the other place. It's, it's so big. It's just the two of us. And we said, look, this is your house. Well, he finally followed that counsel. He bought that house. And within like a year or maybe a year or so later, he got married. And the woman he was married to had two small children. So now, rather than two, the house now accommodates five. And then a year or so later, they had a child themselves, and now there was six. So this house really was, it really was the house. But if we look at our own understanding, if we think about our own knowledge, not knowing that God has a plan, a hope, and a future, so don't make our plans based upon what we see, but know that God has value in things that we don't see. So we have to look at that in our choice and say, God, what do you see in this? And here's the one thing about God's choice. Make a note of this. Make a note. Make a note. With God, there will always be unknowns. There will always be unknowns when it comes to God. You won't have everything on your checklist. When God gives you an answer, it may not be as easy as the simple solution. This, this, all the check boxes are here. It's affordable. It's easy. It's popular. This is what I like. But then there's something over here that God is trying to show you. But, but there's some unknowns there. You, it costs a little bit more. It takes a little bit more time. But, but God is saying, this is not for the you that you are. This is for the you that I'm preparing you to become. Because ultimately, he is preparing you for something greater. And who's going to receive the greater is the greater you. So God God is growing you up into what God has already prepared you for. See, we see things as we are, and God sees things the way we are meant to be. Eye has not seen, as the scripture said, and ear has not heard, nor it into the hearts and thoughts of man 
what God has prepared. You see the word past tense? Not that God will prepare. God has already prepared the way for you. Let's give God a round of praise that he has prepared. Not that God will prepare. God has prepared the way. And if we would just get out of the way, sometimes we can see God's way. Can I get an amen to that? I don't know about you, but I've been in God's way sometime. I've been, been in there trying to do this thing and, and, you know, say, God, no, not this direction. Let me show you, God. Let me give you, here's a, here's a, here's a plan. You know, we're trying to tell God how to do it. You know, when, when, when God says it's not good that man should be alone and Adam was there and, and God caused Adam to fall into a, a deep sleep. And then God took the rib from him and he made woman, right? Now, what was Adam doing during this time when God was creating this? What was Adam? Adam was what? Sleeping. He was in a deep sleep because if Adam had been awake, he'd have been telling God, hey, God, can you add a little bit more? I mean, I like, you know, I'm from the south and we're down south. We're like, can you add, God, can you make it like this? And, and, and we always want to try to tell God how to do it. I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to want to do that sometimes. You want to tell God how to do it as if God doesn't know what is best for us. God knows more and what is best for us than we know for ourselves. We're looking for the present. God sees your present, your past, and your future. And God is, is preparing you for things that you're not really prepared for yet. Just be patient and wait on God. Wait on God. God speaks to us oftentimes through visions and dreams. Yes. That's how God communicates to us, sometimes through the visions and dreams, something that you cannot see in the physical sense, but through your vision, uh, through a dream. And the vision that you see is oftentimes farther than, that you can barely make it out, but it's, but, it's, but it's sort of, you can see the vision, but through faith, if you tune through faith, suddenly you can get more clarity on what God is doing, because he speaks through visions and through, through dreams. And, and Jesus himself, spoke through parables. You know, when Jesus spoke, he didn't teach and give you direct answers. He gave you parable answers. And the parable is a different revelation for everyone who hears it. You can give a story or talk a story in a parable, and one person may understand that this is what he's getting out of it, and somebody gets something totally different out of it. Another person gets something totally different from it. And even when you read a parable, you may get something, a different revelation another time when you read the same parable. That's revelation. That means you read it before and you thought this way, but now you're seeing it differently because God gives you answers through revelation. So the vision gives revelation, and that means it's revealed to you in your spirit. That's revelation. Use an example of the prodigal son. We all know that parable, but I'll give you a brief recap of that. That one of the, A man had two sons, and the younger of the son had decided that he was done, and he wanted to leave home, and he went to his dad and asked for whatever his possessions are, whatever is due to me, I want it now, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to leave, and, and his father granted it to him, whatever his, his possessions his father would give him. Now, these possessions were supposed to be an inheritance that happens after the father died. So it's insulting for the son to come and say, I want my inheritance now because I thought you were going to live this long or whatever the reason. <laughs> he wanted to get his inheritance now, but he got his inheritance. The father granted it to him. Now that tells you, what, that's right, one revelation right there. Because if anybody grew up with a father like I had, you say, Dad, I want my portion. You're like, what portion? You ate your portion this morning. You know, whatever it is. But the father granted him his portion. The son went off and to a foreign place. He didn't want to just stay local. He wanted to just get away from these backwards people. You know, when you first want to move home, you want to move away from these people. So he moved away to a foreign land. He sold, uh, lost all of his possessions through, the Bible says, riotous living. Riotous living. You know, that, you know what riotous living is like? That's, oh yeah, he's just clubbing out there like he lost your mind, you know, just like you don't even know nobody, you know, just like you just totally lost everything you've ever been taught, all your home training, you just flushed it down the toilet. Anyway, he is out there in riotous living, lost everything. And when you lose your money, you lose your cheap friends. Your cheap friends are the ones only there because you've got something that profits them. But when, when you lose your money, they're gone. And, and then he found himself in a hard way, and, and he was in a pig pen feeding 
the swine, which is another thing. He's a Jewish, and, and it was an abomination and unclean for him to be in this setting. He's thinking, how did I end up here? And everything was going so well where he was, and he left the blessing, and he fell into the curse. He was into the curse, and now he's thinking, how did I end up here? But he, then he, he came to himself, the Bible says. He came to himself. He says, I will go back to my father, and I will tell my father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He's going to ask for forgiveness. Just make me one of your servants. You know, I just want to be back in the house. I don't want to, be, I don't deserve to be in the house, just anywhere around the house. I make me a servant. And as he was going back home, his father saw him from a distance. His father saw him, another revelation. Not the servants saw him, his father saw him. That means every day his father's out there saying that maybe, Maybe today is the day that my son will come home. Maybe today God will, will bring him back. God, I know you're taking care of him out there. So his father saw him, and as soon as he saw his son from a distance, he told his servants to kill the fatted calf and let's strike up the band. And they began to have this banquet because my son that was dead is now alive. The one that was lost has now been found. But then he had another son. Remember, we had two sons. There was one son that stayed now, he was not happy that they were celebrating this, this son. Now, why are you giving him the party? I've been here all along, and I, why, why don't I get a party? You know what I mean? Don't you wonder, God, where's my party? You know, everybody else is partying. God, when, is, when do I get a chance to party? You know, God, everybody else has got new stuff, and I'm still dealing with old and used. And God, when is my day coming? So this son was bitter about the things that was happening, and and he went to his dad and says, you know, I've been faithful. I've been here. And now he comes home. He comes home, been out there doing everything that he, who knows what. Now you're going to celebrate him. And he was bitter about that. So again, the, what do you get out of this story? Well, you get so many revelations come from this parable. Jesus didn't say, here's the answer. First, you can talk about the revelation. How did the father see this thing? Then you can talk about the things that the, the son and what he had to identify about friendship and, and, and family and wealth and, and, and all those things. You can talk about the mother because they never talk about the mother, mother in this story. What does the mother have to say? You can see it on behalf of the ones that celebrated with him, that when one comes home, it's time to celebrate. See, there's so many revelations you can get. And if you read this whole story, you may get a different revelation from what I just talked about. Some of the revelations that I got from this one, that it's better to be forgiven than forgotten. Yes. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Yes, right. his, his father had forgave him, but his father never forgot about him. Never, yes. he, he had forgiven him, he already forgiven him. So it's better to be forgiven than forgotten. Anger consumes the angry. Another one. Anger always consumes the ones that are angry. The ones that you're angry with, sometimes they're having a wonderful time. And you're thinking, how can they, I'm angry still. How can they be having a good time when I'm angry? It shouldn't work that way. Anger should affect the other person. Is that right? But no, anger affects the angry. True friends stand by you through what? Thick? Thick and thin. Hmm? Thick and thin. That's a true friend. And it's better to hear than to be heard. Just some of the revelations. Better to, to hear than to be heard. That was a, a reminder of a pastor. They had a, a big church, and rather than having regular keys that fit the doors, they had combinations for the door locks. And a lot of the combinations were lost, and they were thinking, let's get a locksmith out. The pastor said, I got this. Just tell me. Just take me to the door. They would take him to the door, and he look at the combination. Then he'd look up, and then he'd dial it in. Perfect combination. Every door, he'd get there, and he'd look up, and then he'd dial it. And they were around him and saying, that's amazing. How could you get a revelation from God at every door? He says, no, no, it's on the ceiling right here. They, they, we, put the, we put the combination on the ceiling because we knew that people would forget the combination. OK, I don't write them. I just, I just give them to you. <laughs> Sometimes we suffer because we just don't look up. Sometimes we look up. The answer sometimes is, is way above where we are. We're, we're looking around, but we just don't look up. Sometimes the answer is closer than you, than you think. Take this first point down, this first point. Revelation is a divine answer. Revelation is a divine answer. It reveals God's plan. When you have a revelation, God's trying to reveal to you his plan. That means you have to stop thinking about your plan 
God, what is your plan? That's what you have to ask God. What is your plan? Because God's trying to reveal something to you that may not coincide with what you're asking God. God may have a different plan, right? His thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. As far as the east is from the west, so are God's thoughts from your thoughts and his ways from your ways. So the way that you're trying to do it may not be the way that God is trying to reveal to you how to do it. So Revelation reveals to you God's plans. It's God's divine answer. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9, going back to where we were initially, it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things which God has prepared, again, that word has prepared for those who love him, those who love him. Make another note, all knowledge of God and from God comes by way of revelation. All knowledge of God and from God comes by way of revelation. If you read the scripture, the scripture is an uncovering or an unveiling. The scripture is a disclosure of what is already known. When God discloses something to you through revelation, you already know it. So what God is confirming is what he's already placed in you. You'll open up scripture sometime and the scripture will go right to a page and that page will speak to you exactly what you've been praying about or what you need clarity about. God will give that to you. That's through scripture. It's right there. I just flipped open the Bible and right there God was speaking. That's revelation. Sometimes people, will, again through revelation, will find him in prison. They'll find Jesus in prison. You know, that, that happens a lot. People say, I found Jesus in prison. They say, Jesus, what are you in here for? You know, what, what? <laughs> anyway, they, but they'll find him there. And that's revelation. Because it took that situation, that circumstance for them to really hear him. People have been talking to them all their lives probably about him, but somehow they couldn't hear him, but they had to get into a certain place so the revelation can come. The revelation comes to those who are prepared to receive it. If you're not prepared to receive it, it just, it sounds good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. But if you're not ready to receive it, you just go on and with your own understanding and do what you will do. People have spoken unto you the truth, a revelation, and you weren't ready to receive it, and you went another whole direction. And you found out that mama was right, or somebody that spoke to you or something was right. But again, the revelation was there, but were you ready? Are you prepared to receive the revelation? And the problem with not receiving and following the revelation of God, you go through a lot of anguish and it, and it costs. It's, it costs more. It's time consuming to get back to where you know you should have been. Yes, yes. It takes a lot to get back. And, and it takes a lot of humility to, to, to figure that out. Revelation begins when you surrender those things that did not allow you to receive it. To get a revelation, you have to surrender the things yes. that does not allow you to receive the revelation. And some of the things that does not allow you to see the, receive the revelation are pride. Yeah. Don't want nobody to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You had anybody like that in your life? You're trying to tell them something. I know, I know, I know, I know. Then what? I don't know. <laughs> pride will block your revelation because you know it all. You don't want to receive anything new or different from anybody else. Anger. Anger is another one. You get angry. Some people are just, you know, just flip the switch. One word, suddenly they're angry. And now you're so angry that you miss what anybody is trying to say to you because anger is steering the ship. So pride, anger, guilt, fear, apathy, lust, all of those things will rob you of the revelation that God's trying to get to you. Lust, especially lust. Let's talk about that for a moment, shall we? Lust, that idea that you want something for self-gratification. You're not looking at the long term or any term at all. You're just looking at it for right now. That's not Miss Right, but it's Miss Right Now. <laughs> Mr. Right Now. Better than no now. And that lust gets you into lacking what God has for you. Sometimes we'll take what's present and we'll miss what's promised. We miss what's promised. God has a promise, but that means you have to forsake the present to get the promise. Yes, yes. 
And it's hard if you're under lust, if you, if you function by lust and what you want right now, you, you're not going to let anything pass you by. You're going to hit everything that comes your direction and not knowing that you're tripping your own self up until you can get rid of that. You're not going to get what God has for you. Because God can give you the right thing. If you're the wrong person at the wrong time, you will, you will just pass it off. You will not be able to receive it. It was for you, but, but you're not ready yet. You're not ready for it yet. So you, you missed it. You missed it. God was trying to bring it to you, but you missed it. And again, I'm preaching to myself because there's been many times where something has come to me. It was right. It felt good, but I wasn't ready. So what I do, I blew it. I blew it. And we're good at doing that. We'll blew it and we'll be proud about it. Well, it just wasn't for me. You know, it was not for everybody, you know, whatever. But when you know it, but here's the thing about when you get the revelation, when God, and I love that God gives you second chances. Yes. I love it when he gives you a second chance because when, you, when he comes back the second time, you're like, oh no, I'm not going to miss it this time. I missed it before. Oh no. Oh, the devil is a liar. You know, <laughs> we're going to get that. We're going to pray. You want it? Oh no, devil. Get out of the way. I'm getting this one. This one's for me. Yeah. But, but that's when you know God. You, you're listening. You're open to what God is trying to say to you. And you've got to be able to receive it because the old you, the, the old you has cost so much. They said that education is expensive, but ignorance costs a whole bunch more. The things you did not know cost you more than if you stopped to get revelation and understanding. It costs you so much more. Let's look at Proverbs chapter number four. There's two scriptures I want to look at here. Proverbs chapter number four, verse number seven, and Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18. Proverbs four and verse number seven says, wisdom is the principal thing that's good. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get what? Get what? Understanding. understanding. Wisdom is great, but be able to understand. That means the application of your wisdom, understanding. In Proverbs 29 and verse 18, where there is no revelation, uh, we also know this is a saying where there's no vision. Where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint or the people perish. Where there is no revelation. But happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is he who keeps the law. You can become good by instruction. But to become great, you need revelation. Yes. You can become good. People can instruct you and you can learn a lot of things in, in just applying knowledge. But if you really want to become great, that means you have to have revelation. You have to start learning how to receive from God. And that means let God reveal stuff to you and follow what God is trying to say to you. That means you're no longer listening to anyone else around you. Your teachers have taken you as far as they can take you. And at some point, you start getting a revelation about where you go from here. That's where you really learn to master something. The revelation. You can't become a great father, a great parent, or whatever you do by just getting instruction. At some point, that person has to show up inside of you. Whoever you want to become has to show up in you, and it has to be now guided by the spirit that's given you the instruction, the knowledge, the understanding, the awareness to be what you must become. And that only comes through revelation. Someone can only take you so far by giving you instruction, but you got to now turn yourself and turn your children or whatever over to God and let God instruct you from that point forward and give you revelation to take you to where you ultimately need to be. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? Do you, do you understand that? Amen, amen, amen. Okay, that's revelation. Now let's go to the next one. Revelation is revealed into your spirit. Revelation, the first one, revelation is a divine answer. The next, revelation is revealed into your spirit, your spirit. You'll never understand it. You, you won't get it up here. When, when God's trying to give you something, it won't make sense to you. So don't try to figure God out or figure out what God is saying. You have to accept it. Believe it in here. It starts revealing itself as you walk by faith. You want the answer. You want it all clear right now. When you believe in God for something, the revelation comes. And now you've got to walk in it. And as you're walking in it, in faith, not having all of the answers, it starts revealing itself. This is the right place. This is where I'm supposed to be. But it doesn't appear to be that way at first. It, it appears to be inconvenient. It's not what you were right. It's a few unanswers. Remember the unknowns. But we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you can say that, you got to walk it. you got to do it. We don't just talk by faith because we get it on paper. We take the test. We can get all of this on the answers on the test, but we've got to walk it. That means the road test. 
You got to really get out there and do it. That's a challenge. Jeremiah, Job, a lot of people want physical, Gideon was one that wanted a physical revelation. In other words, they want, show me. Anybody from Missouri? Yeah, Yvonne is from Missouri, right? The show me state. We, we believe in God. I believe you, God. I believe you, God. But could you show me? Because if we believe God, then we should be, be, be able to believe just by faith. If we really believe God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. That means if a person is not guided by the Spirit, when the Spirit of God reveals something to them, not only do they not accept it, it don't make any sense. It's stupid. It's foolishness. It's, it doesn't make any sense. But that's why the Spirit has revealed things to you, and you have to accept that the Spirit is guiding you, and you have to go that direction. But that totally denies all sensory, all understanding. That means you got to put your brain, don't think, just follow God. And that's where God proves himself. The just are guided by faith, not by knowing Whatever you're doing, if you're following God, you know that God puts you in an uncharted place to where you're not sure how you ended up here. You're not sure what God is doing, but you're trusting him, and God keeps revealing you a little bit at a time. It's that little, it's that little bit that keeps you going the, right, the same direction. Not the whole plan, but enough that God says, okay, God, I took a step, and okay, God's here. And you took the next step and God's showing up over here. And every time you do something, you find out God is showing up, revealing himself. You see, that's what it means to walk by faith. That means that every time I take a step, God was already there beckoning you on to your next step. Yes. God is meeting you at your next step. He brought you here. Yes. Now the next step is where you're going to meet God. Now, and God says, take a step. And if you take your next step, you'll find out that God shows up at that next step. And everywhere you go, you may not see the answer, but God says, don't worry about what you see. Take the step. Yes. And as you take the step, God starts revealing himself through the steps that you're taking. And you find out that's what it means to really walk by faith and not by sight. When Peter, I'm sorry, when Thomas was not there when Jesus appeared and then they said, we've seen the Lord. He says, I, I will not believe it unless I touch, put my hand in his palm prints and put my hand in his side. And then when Jesus showed up, the next time he told Thomas to come, put your hand in my hands, put your hand in my side. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, blessed are you because you have seen and believed. But more blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. When you have not seen yet believe, listen to this. Do you believe because you saw it or do you believe because you know it? When you believe something because you see it, that's called a physical revelation. But when you get a spiritual revelation, you believe something and now you know it. When you know something to be so, when you know it, no one has to tell you, it's not because I saw it, it's because I know it. I rather believe something because I know it, not because I saw it. Why, why, why do you believe in Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Because I know it. But, but what, what evidence did you have? I don't need the evidence, I know. See, when you know, you don't need the evidence to prove what God already has revealed to you. Number three, revelation brings understanding. Revelation brings understanding. Galatians chapter number one, verses number 11 and verse number 12. Galatians 1, 11 through 12. Read it with me. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It comes through revelation. Revelation is what we need during a crisis. What we're going through right now, we need revelation. Yes. We need a revelation, not just an answer, a revelation. If you ever struggle with something, maybe a problem you're dealing with, or I remember when I used to, take math classes. I used to work with math equations and whether it's a physics equation or whatever, these equations, 
And I would spend all day on working on this and couldn't get the answer because I'm trying to find the answer. I want the answer. And we always are looking for, and we're praying and believing God for the answer. And God wants to give us the revelation. That's, that's what God wants. You want the answer. God wants to give you the revelation. Now, here's what happened. When I'm working on some problems, I'm sleeping. And while I'm in bed, boom, what comes? Not the answer. The revelation comes. And I'll get up out of bed. I don't know if you've been to get up out of bed because suddenly you've been working on this thing all day. You get up out of, get out of bed, come in, you, and you work through it. That's a revelation. Now, revelation does not just give you the answer. Revelation gives you the principle. See, see when, you, when you get the answer, you go from problem to problem. Now you need the answer to the next problem. So you go from answer to answer to answer. But when God gives you the revelation, now he lets you see how to solve everything else that is coming in that area. A revelation gives you the principle because once you can work through that problem, now you apply the principle that allows you to work through the next problem. And the principle that allows you to work through the next one. That's what revelation does. God, I want to just give you one answer. We always pray God for answer to answer to answer. And God said, if you came to get the revelation, you'll find out that I've already given you the answers. I want you to get the revelation. That way we can teach others. We can share with others. We can guide others. How can you help someone when you can barely help yourself? But when God is there to guide you through it all, God gives you that revelation, that understanding that no one else can know. Revelation re always reveals the principle, the principle. How do we receive this revelation? How do I get this revelation, Pastor? How do I get this? Last week we talked about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's our, that's our part. If we would do that part, Bible, the Bible says, God says, then I will hear from heaven. So if you've missed part of what you're supposed to do, and you're trying to get, a, get God to give you an answer or a revelation, but you're still not humbling yourself, you're not praying, you're not seeking God's face, you're still not turning away from the evil in your life, then God's not hearing. Nothing is changing. Our nation, our world right now needs to humble itself and be still and know that God is still God. He never stopped being God. We may have turned away from him, but he never turned away from us. God still believes in us more than we ever. God still believes in you. We may not believe in God. We found something else to replace God with, but God says, I still believe in you. Just like that prodigal son, even though the son was out there, the father was still believing in the son. He knew that somehow that son would get the revelation, would come back to him. And God's hoping that somehow the world gets the revelation, would come back to God. He still believes in us. He still believes. Humble yourself, he says, and then pray. A nation that prays together stays together. The world that prays together comes together humbling ourselves and praying and then seeking God's face again. Not God's hand, not God's provision, not God's answers. We're really coming for God. We're seeking him with all of our heart. And then it says, turn away from your wicked ways. That means we're abandoning all those things that hinders us from God's best. The only way that you could enter into the holiest of holies is you had to consecrate yourself. You had to get rid of all sin. You had to come and, and repent. And if we could repent right now as a world, repent and humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn away from the evil and the wrongdoing, he says, then I will hear. I'm waiting. God is waiting. He says, I will hear. I will hear from heaven. And then God forgives us. It's great to be forgiven. Oh, it's great to be able to let it all go and know that you... Your sins are before God, and God says, I've wiped it away into the sea of forgetfulness. You have been forgiven. You have been restored. King David talked about what it was like in Psalm 32, that when God restored him, he said it was like when God was away from him, it was like the drought of summer, he said. But when God restored him, it's like suddenly he could feel his vitality, his life coming back to him again. 
The world needs to feel the presence of God. The people, we need to get back to that place that in God we trust, in God we believe, the God that we know. He says, I will forgive your sins and I will heal your land. Our healing comes from above down. God wants, he has he's prepared it for us. He's already prepared what we need. We've got to look up. We've got to praise up. We've got to lift up. Yes. We've got to know that the answer has already been provided to us. Repent. There may be somebody out there right now who do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You may have never prayed that prayer of salvation, never accepted him. I'm going to give you some words to say. And these words are just a confession I'm going to lead you in. Just believe this confession with all of your heart. But confess it out of your mouth. Say it out of your mouth. Say, Father, forgive me. I repent of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe that God raised him from the dead. By this confession, I'm saved. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. My next prayer is for those that may have lost their way. You already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you have backslidden. You've already, you may have turned away. But just say, Father, forgive me. Thank you for never leaving me. Thank you for never forsaking me. I choose Jesus. Use me now. Mold me. Make me what you would have me to be. I accept Jesus Christ and I use him. I believe him to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, God.